Kamala Harris said no shortage of falsehoods during the debate last night. And a recent article at TheBlaze.com broke down her top five. And the first one is the fine people hoax. Kamala Harris repeated the lie that Donald Trump called white supremacists in Charlottesville, Virginia, fine people. Liz, I want to start with you because you wrote out all the lies last night from Kamala Harris. So what was the worst one, in your opinion? I didn't write them all down because we only had an hour and a half to watch, but I did keep I did keep a list of some of the most egregious lies. I it all politicians lie, right? But the difference that I felt and I think a lot of us watching felt last night is she was so brazen about it. She looked us right in the eye without flinching, without blinking, without the usual guilty symptoms that, you know, if I tried to tell a lie to Steve, I'd probably be like nervous and twitching because my body's not used to telling lies. She looked at us ice water in her veins. She lied about late term abortion. She lied about the very fine people, Charlottesville hoax. She lied about January 6th. She lied about the bloodbath comment. She lied about crime data in our cities across the country. She lied about her stance on border security. She lied, I believe, three times about Project 2025. And she lied about fracking. And yet, not one of those times did the ABC moderators correct her. And I'm not one to complain about a biased stage or moderators that are unfair. It's kind of par for the course. Like if you're good enough at debating, whatever, biased moderators shouldn't bother you more than maybe like a little bit of an annoyance. But I don't like being a person that complains about that. But they really outdid themselves. I mean, that was propaganda to the level of Pravda, what they were engaging in. And it enabled, the reason I'm bringing it up is not even to complain about it per se, but to explain why Kamala Harris was so brazen. She knew that she could tell those lies without any fear of being not only caught, but even slightly challenged because they are 100,000% in her tank. Awful. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious uh, what we think about this because we know that they lie. And we know that they're willing to say anything. And we know that they won't be fact-checking themselves. Um, so uh, given that, we've seen now the facility. That's the new thing that we learned, I think. The facility with which Kamala Harris can do it and get away with it without looking like uh, the borderline uh, brain-dead person that you know we've seen the clips of for the last few years. And, and by the way, that was my take on the debate, was simply Trump had ridiculously high expectations in the sense the entire right thought he was going to go out again and have a historic knockdown. And all Kamala had to do, if you're on the right, is not seem retarded, which is what you think of her because you've just seen the clips of her over and over again and you love to hate her, right? So we know that they're going to do this. So my question to you guys is, okay, uh, we've seen the playbook. We know the playbook. So what happens next? I think we don't need to have moderators for debates. I don't know why the media has to be directly involved at all. Uh, we've already eliminated the Presidential Commission on Debates, which is uh, essentially a, a who's who of, of swamp creatures as it is. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think we ought to just do this as jury selections. Um, each campaign, uh, just have the people, just have Mar Americans film videos on their phones. Everybody's got one of these. Okay. You have a question for a presidential candidate. It's got to be less than 90 seconds. All right. Uh, film it, send it, email it here. Um, each campaign gets all the questions. We're going to have a 90 minute debate, nine minutes on each question. OK. Uh, and a two minute potty break, maybe. OK. And then each campaign or well, and each campaign gets to choose five questions, uh, five of the videos. And then, you know, there's nine minutes on each. We have a running clock. And if you guys can't be adults and you just sit there and scream and talk over each other, that'll tell the American people one thing. If you guys can handle it, you know, let people talk. But every nine, you get nine minutes to hash this thing out and answer this person's question. And there's 10 of them. And each campaign chooses five. And we just rolled it, rolled the tape. We don't, I don't know why we need moderators. I don't know why we need any, any of this. Yeah, These people are running for the most powerful office in the world. There's no moderators when you're negotiating with Putin and Zelensky. There's there's no moderators when you're over there with the the you know the the little dweeb with the bull haircut and his finger on the trigger in Pyongyang. There's no moderators. Nobody's fact checking the conversation with the World Economic Forum or the uh, you know the G8. Okay, it's freaking President of the United States. It's, it's not a Matthew Broderick movie. So just get questions from the American people. They're going to ask better ones anyway. Each campaign gets to choose the five they want. You can choose gotcha ones, substantive ones. You can choose a mixture of both. And if the questions aren't fair, that's a you problem. You suck at this like you suck seating a jury. Nine minutes, roll clock, and let's just have a debate. Then it's done. Liz, I like this because 
last night, it's not like we got a wide range of questions that people on the right would be concerned to hear about with with the both of the candidates that are up on stage. Yeah. Do you know what else? I, I like that. idea. I would definitely watch that kind of debate that you suggested. But I think it would also be interesting if the candidates ask each other questions. Imagine Trump going up there and asking Kamala about targeting David Daleiden. You used to let him do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that would be, I mean, and good candidates who disagree with the premise of a question will still do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what I suggested that Trump do last night is ask her questions as the answers to his own questions. Mm -hmm. Since we know what he was as president and we need to showcase to the American people what she is trying to hide with her batty demeanor. That is, of course, her radical policies. But I think it would be great if they go up there and say, listen, do you regret leaving up this X post where you ask people to donate to the Minnesota Freedom Fund, which bailed out violent criminals who were torching Minneapolis? Mm -hmm. That would be great if Trump asked her that. And it would be totally fine if she came back and said, do you think that you're fit to run as a convicted felon? Mm -hmm. Because you know that the way that you phrase questions showcases how either smart or not you are. It also is intended to show to the American people your position on an issue and draw out from your opponent their their issue. That's actually what I would do moving forward, going back to your point, right. is what Trump should have done last night. But he can do this moving forward, is just highlight to the American people her radical policies over and over again. Don't get triggered. Don't fall for the bait. Just show that you are on the right side of the issues because you are. I think we uh, we have a plan. We need to propose. Blaze Media <laughs> will host solved, a debate solved. Yes. for the American people. The American people will ask questions, and then we'll let the candidates ask and each Kamala other's Harris questions. Kamala Harris is going to jump all over that. Come on yeah. down to Dallas. <laughs> We're ready for you. Um, okay, well, what about this? A lot of people I've heard talking about this today, uh, regular people asking questions about, you know, will they debate again? Should Trump debate again if he gets the chance? Do we have any thoughts about that? I can't believe that, that Kamala would give Trump another chance. I, I think a lot of this is bravado. I think a lot of it is they I think they now believe after last night they can bait Trump into almost anything. And I think even this morning he took the bait. Well, I'll do a debate on Fox if it's not Brett Baer or Martha McCallum. The reality is he should have been down. He should be doing uh, at Brett Baer's studio right now, trying to get her back on stage as soon as absolutely possible. So I, I think that now they see themselves uh, as having leverage here. They can throw things out. They can pester him uh, and and come up with conditions that he'll never agree to and say, well, he ducked us because we agreed to debate him already on his terms. Not saying it's right. Okay, I'm just, you know, looking at it from the enemy's perspective. But I I mean, that would be a gift from above under any circumstances if they let Donald Trump have another shot at Kamala Harris. We should we should be thanking Jesus for that quite literally. I I can't believe that they would in the end do that. Well, I think when you look at Donald Trump, if you're his team right now, all you should be doing for your debate prep is insulting him. Constant insults thrown at him and say, (laughs) don't take the bait, because that's what got him in trouble last night. But you guys, I want to move on from just what's happening right now with the debates and say what's going to happen as we move forward. There's 55 days left until the election. So what can happen in that amount of time to push this narrative forward, to make red states redder, to try and figure out how to get Donald Trump in office once again? What I would do if I were Donald Trump, aside from using all of the Kamala clips from the debate to to fact check and to highlight her radical policies, is I would do um, more of what he's been doing by going on those bro podcasts. He went on the all was it the all in podcast? He went on Theo Vaughn. He's appealing to young men. And it's interesting because. He's doing that almost on the side. It seems that his campaign has this strategy of trying to reach out to suburban women. And I don't think that that's a good idea, not because suburban women should be discounted, but because they're ideologically on the left. And that's quite a task to undo someone's ideological um, anchor and then convince them to go vote for someone else. But young men, by and large, especially if you look at surveys the last couple of years, especially there's been this great increase in young men who are leaning conservative. So they already agree with you. All you have to do then is one task, get them to turn out to vote because young men actually vote in lower percentages than young women do. And so I would focus my campaign, if I'm Trump, on these people who already agree with you, who just need to be convinced to vote. And I think that that would make a greater difference than kind of stepping out of character, trying to be, he's trying to be gentle. He's trying to be uh, appeal to people who don't really agree to him, but he's doing it in a way that's actually shifting his own policies versus persuading them that his policies are best for them. And I think that's one of the missteps actually of his, of his campaign strategy, not just his, um, not just of the debate, but I would love to see that from him in the next couple of weeks. I would, I think that's really good. 
I, I would say let's have some perspective first. The, the election is in 55 days. 55 days ago, Joe Biden was still the Democratic nominee for president. 55 days ago, we were just a couple of days from Donald Trump taking a bullet to the face. So um, I, I get frustrated when we allow things to just kind of happen to us rather than take a, a initiative. I, I'm a big believer as a general rule in life, you solve your problems with aggression. OK, I mean, I, I teach my son, uh, you're better off making the wrong move quick than waiting too long to make the right move because you have time to make up for a mistake. You don't have time for time that you lost and the opportunity is closed. But there is still plenty of time for the organic events that, that we would need to seize to happen to occur. And I would expect that a few of them we can't even foresee right now here today will happen. That being said, I'm going to go to a movie that was very popular in Matt and I's generation with young, when we were young men, all right? And it had a tagline, okay? ABC, always be closing, right? The Trump campaign needs to be ABI, okay? Always be issues. Everything's about issues, all right? We're not chasing any more damn rabbit trails. We're not going down any more, uh, is she Indian, is she black, okay? Which, which you know, uh, it, does she read the King James or the ESV? We're not doing any more of that, okay? ABI always about we're always always be about issues the amount the treasure trove of content that she presented in this debate on the issues is is bountiful I mean the the challenge I would have if I were a, in, involved in Trump's campaign messaging is picking ones the, the targets are so abundant that the temptation would be to hit them all and therefore you cancel yourself out so what are the two or three greatest hits that i'm going to hammer home over and over again because away from all the flash and sizzle reel and and the moderator and everything else when you boil it all down kamala harris showed no regard for the suffering of the american people last night she showed no remorse or self-awareness about the role her administration has played in it and showed she had no plan to do anything about it and that's to, if i'm on the trump campaign that is my big takeaway, and I'm hammering that, and I'm using clips from this debate of her speaking in that regard the next 55 days. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think I think the the aggressiveness has to be there, and they have to be facile, and they have to move quick. So it's a very DC thing to look at numbers, and a bunch of political nerds sit there and like we will wave a little IVF flag, and then we'll get this demographic that now hates us mm -hmm. to move over. That's ridiculous thinking. Who is actually on your side? Take the wave of of a support on your side and direct that towards the rest of the American people and invite them in. So some examples of this would be. Now, and you're not going to get your own media. You have to make your own media. So some make your own story. So examples of this would be Springfield. I mean, I would go there. I'd go to Ohio. I'd go to numerous places, Ohio, talk to people who are in support. Mm -hmm. Even Mike DeWine right now is going to call out the National Guard, noted MAGA extremist. Uh, and so you go out there. You know you have them on the run. You go exactly what Steve said. You aggressively go right to that point. You look in the camera, and then you put out your own media. Mm -hmm. You know, Blaze Media would be there. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll be there. Uh, and, uh, you know, every Everyone else will be there and will just project out. And they could do that on every issue. Go somewhere, talk to a family. You want to do fracking? Go to a place that's been influenced negatively by fracking. Let regular people talk about it and then dare the rest of the conservative media to follow you and push the message out on some of these major issues. And what I, what I hate about where we're at now is we don't have the time to play the D.C. games about, oh, if we just change this policy or we have Correct. this little doodad or this little this is go time. Everyone knows it's serious. Go to the serious issues and push them out. I look at it as a failure, though, because we're not sitting around here talking about how great Donald Trump was on immigration, on just the economy, the big issues that honestly, this should have been one of the easier debates with as bad as things are in the country right now, just pointing it out every single time that she would say something to say, OK, you're the you're current vice president right now. How is this not the lasting message that we walked away from in that debate last night? Okay, but but I, I think I think that's right. In the debate though, I mean this is this is I think what we're saying is go outside the debate. I mean yeah. take the debate yeah, yeah. to so you want to talk about Kamala Harris or problems? Have a press conference from California. Go to San Francisco with a backdrop behind you of people in the streets and say, This is what she did. This is this is the result of her policy. Right. And get outside of the fact checkers that way. But you've got to be you're going to have to be very detailed. So, for example, the moment last night when Springfield came up, OK, he should have already called the woman when he saw the clip, should have picked up the phone, 
picked up his cell phone, called, said, hey, I, I'm, I, this is Donald Trump. Call the city manager yourself. Who was it? Call the city council. I want to talk to that woman. I want her name. I want her story. I want to hear what she has to say. I'm citing her at the debate. I can't just go in there and wing it. And I can't say, well, Laura Ingram said this. Was, that, you're, I mean, you just, you can't do that. Okay. And, and the thing that I'm the most frustrated by of going back to, you know, the panic over COVID and handing the presidency to Fauci and everything we've seen at times in this campaign is if there's one person in America that, that, that we should understand that the left has turned this into a zero sum game. They've tried to put him in prison. They've tried to take his family fortune away from him. Okay. They tried, they impeached him. They took, they, they, they did a, a three year coup against his presidency. And then they dropped another coup called a scandemic on him and executed another one. And yet, for some odd reason, he still doesn't, in terms of the way he prepares for battle with them, does not treat it like a zero sum game. Like he can just kind of just walk in, wing it, and, 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 and not have stuff on lockdown. Right. And I understand from a personality standpoint, Matt, he's way more Patton than Eisenhower, all right? I get it that he's the general that leads the tank division, doesn't sit in the control room with the nerds like us. I understand that, okay? But the idea that Patton just hopped in a tank and said, hey, guys, let's go take North Africa. Mm -hmm. They had plans. I mean, and, and, and they had ideas. They had execution. They had strategies. And what you saw last night was a guy just kind of winging it up against a coordinated strategy and you saw in the end, no matter how extraordinarily talented he is, no matter how much guile he has, which is maybe his greatest gift, that he just refuses to be sunk by things that most men would just walk away from, all right? He could not overcome the coordinated hit job that was being done on him. And I think he clearly did not listen to his advisors. He clearly did not listen to the debate prep team. And that is not, we need him to win. That's not going to cut it for the next 55 days. You're not a cuck to have a plan. OK, they need to have a freaking plan. He needs to listen to it. He's not a child. Quit blaming the advisors. He needs to listen to it and then go out and execute it.